Welcome to the Leader's Journey Podcast. I'm Joel Gunn, and I've got Robert Vogel back with me. Robert, the last episode was awesome. You were talking about your trip to South Africa. Wonderful and trip. It was. Uh, sounds like it was very touching, um, not just what you shared on the air, but before and, and since. Um, but we, you, you got back from South Africa. You, you met a lot of uh, senior leaders, billion-dollar companies and otherwise uh, while you were over there. And then around that same time, you also gathered with all the C12 chairs from across the nation. What's mm-hmm. your read on, like, we're very much post-pandemic. Um, things have settled into a new norm. Where, what are you seeing out in the marketplace, especially among leaders or leadership? Around leaders and leadership. I think that um, uh, some of the opportunities that, that were predicted would be in play and when I say predicted, I'm talking about seven, eight years ago. I think some of those things are starting to show up. I think that there's some truth in what some some thoughts of people that were trying to peek around the corner when it comes to leadership and what is what is that what does that mean? What's it what's it going to take? So a, a couple of foundational elements: our population isn't really decreasing, right? So our people base, the number of people that must be served and led and taken care of, is is continues to be on on uh, the rise overall. And uh, uh, M and A is on the increase. So the the merger and acquisitions, uh, a lot of companies getting swallowed up, and um, it's just going to continue to happen. And other companies, because of the economic issues, are going to fold. So it's going to move in in this other direction. Yet at the same time, the larger companies are becoming more fragile mm-hmm. than ever. Right, because of the economic thing, we really can't continue with our uh, debt that we have in this country, where the GDP isn't outpacing the debt, where the debt is outpacing the GDP. Uh, that has to come to an end. Um, that's going to crumble in some way, right? It's it just, it's just what it's going it's to do. Math. It's yeah. just math. It, it is what it is. And so um, you, you kind of mix that all up in the bag. And you say, okay, what does the landscape look like? What do we think the landscape is going to be if nothing was to change? Well, in order to make that change happen, we need leaders that are willing to make those changes. And uh, we have more education um, in the marketplace than, than, let's say, from my generation. There are more people that graduate or go to secondary uh, school, college, master's, PhDs that happen to be out there. Um, than in past generations. So there's more knowledge. We have access to more knowledge freely mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of the internet, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yet at the same time, we have weaker and weaker leaders. Mm. Um, at the conference, it was, it was identified that there is um, 3.7 million men between the ages of 18 and 28 that just don't want to work. Wow. And that's significant. I don't know what that is as a percent total of how what the population. We're about 350 million ish, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, what po- what percentage of that population is that age group? And in that age group, what does 3.7 million represent? But it's it's a chunk because that's never been seen in our history before. Mm. Even during the depression, during the depression, everybody wanted to work, but there weren't any jobs. Today. We're on the on the cusp of recession, depression type feelings and economic landscape, um, and people just don't want to work. Um, leaders today, uh, younger folks, much more fearful of conflict um, and engaging in doing what needs to be done. The moral compass has gotten dimmer as to what that looks like. So, isn't it interesting that we could see the knowledge base is actually stronger? Um, but the fortitude is decreased. Mm. Um, so what, what, is that, what does that mean? What was predicted is that we're going to have kind of a sucking sound on leadership. Um, you know, what it took in order to be, get into the C-suite may have been a 9 out of 10. You had to be that kind of leader. Now it's 6 out of 10 mm-hmm. in order to be C-suite. Mm. Um, and it's going to take strong leaders to be able to move, um, move where we need to go from a community standpoint, city, state, and nation. And I, um, so I wonder, uh, it, the current leaders, do they feel that itch, that call that says, am I in the way? How do I bring these people up? Um, you know, we would, as people of faith, we would call that discipleship. 
how are we discipling that individual? Mm -hmm. How do we help them make those really difficult ethical uh, decisions? How do they discern those things? Where do they find wisdom? Um, well, how do they grab a hold of their moral compass? Uh, where does that moral compass come from? Mm. Um, and how do they lead well? And I, I see less and less of great leadership being demonstrated, mm. even at the experience levels, right? We've got a lot of leaders that have been, that are very successful according to world standards. Mm -hmm. um, but are they demonstrating great leadership? Mm. We're not seeing that as much. Not as many books are being written about those types of leaders. You, you were only in South Africa for 10 days or so uh, and saw a dozen companies. Was there any sharp contrast between those leaders and American leaders? Again, you, you had a very small subset, so I'm not saying the whole nation's that way. Sure. Um, one, one story, there, there's a, a, a gentleman um, that uh, it, it just— Charismatic, gregarious, bigger than life, excited about what he does. And, um, you know, mining is a, a major industry for South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's in the manufacturing side of, of building those great, big, massive, like example of one of thousands of different SKUs that they do. But, you know, the, the, the dump truck beds mm -hmm. on those massive dump trucks, mm -hmm. right, where the tires happen to be 20 feet tall kind of yeah. deal. Uh, they make put a small city in the back of a dump truck. Right. <laughs> they make those, right? Um, and uh, all he could do was talk about people, how to raise people, how to hire people, how to train people. Training in that kind of job is a big deal, right? Uh, I think I, I identified that minimum wage was $1.87 per hour mm -hmm. for minimum wage. Well, those folks that are skilled labor are getting paid in, with 40% unemployment. Getting that kind of a job is a big deal. How do you train, develop, nurture those individuals? That's all he talked about. He had these beautiful publications. Um, they were called Dream, very similar to what we've seen some companies here who have borrowed from the Dream Maker. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you help people achieve dreams? Well, th this is just one page after another of employee stories, achieving their dreams, achieve, uh, achieving some accomplishment. Um, uh, a goal that they had and he builds them up and he lifts them up and he raises them up in front of the company. Um, he delegates and pushes work into them, giving them opportunity, mm -hmm. giving them little projects to be able to grow with, finding out who's going to be able to move along. Um, very similar to like uh, the movie, The Forge, mm -hmm. you know, where that CEO grabbed a hold of that young man that was clearly troubled. Something moved him to say, I'm going to walk with you for a period of time. Mm-hmm. And um, that was very evident in multiple leaders that I had, but him especially. Mm. It was uh, uh, so refreshing to see a caliber of leader like that that was all about the people. He never really talked about the product. He didn't talk about the revenue of the organization or how big the rev it was. It was, let me, let me show you my people. Mm. Um, I think we need more demonstration of that, more willingness to pour into others. Mm -hmm. We need good leaders. We yeah. need that 20 something that is going to be a bright shining star at 30 something to be a yeah, good leader. The old, the old uh, celebrated, not tolerated kind of culture. Mm -hmm. you know, go where you're celebrated. Um, you mentioned the word delegate. Uh, I believe that's a topic uh, for C12 this coming month uh, is this idea of is the CEO or the leader a bottleneck? Yes. Uh, where do you expect that to go, those conversations across the nation, based on your, your experience with CEOs? Well, if leaders stay in their normal, habitual ways, not very far. <laughs> but I have a hope. Yeah. I have a hope. Maybe there's, maybe there's enough of a pinch. Mm. Maybe this call that we're, we're just now talking about says, I need to be able to, to not remove myself but I've got to give other people the opportunity to be exposed to these areas of doing business, uh, to learn, to engage, to, to pick up the reins on that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the old comment that delegation is really an act of saying, I don't trust you, right? Only I can do it the way I want it to be done versus spending the time of 
nurturing and training that individual to do it in a way that was acceptable to the leader that is delegating it. Uh, but we don't want to spend that much time with that individual. Mm-hmm. It's just easier to do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the year, they would have already been trained and then we wouldn't have to do it again. Um, are we willing to, to pause for a moment in that? So there is a hope that we would be able to stir that spirit of being able to say, we've got to bring people up. We've got to expose it. You and I like to like to unpack stuff. Um, let's unpack that idea of why leaders don't delegate. You mentioned a word in their trust. I suspect there's some other words there, but why do you think leaders don't delegate? Well, it's it's a little bit of a founder's uh, syndrome. And also, even if it isn't a founder's, um, we start our careers being really good at something. Right. We're, we're technicians. We're very good at making something happen. And there we're usually really good at getting other people to see that we're really good at doing those things. And we get elevated along the way. And then the, when the technician moves into management where they're now managing the task and leading others, and then it, then there's another transition that happens where the person is managing less and leading more. But in order to do that, we have to let go of the very thing that made us successful. Mm. That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. If I'm really good at A, but I want to be a leader and I have to let go of A, then will I be found out? Or maybe I'll fail. Or um, I won't be seen in the same light. I won't get the same kudos. Um, Those those are all ego-generated things, Mm -hmm. but they're real. They're emotional. Um, and I don't think leaders like stepping into the, the realm of I'm going to possibly fail. Mm. I think we're all kind of wired like that. We have different tolerances. levels of tolerances, yeah. sure. But nobody, you know, signs up for the idea of <laughs> I'm, I want to be seen as a failure. And I think that that's hard to do. And in small business, uh, small to mid-sized business, um, uh, a lot of leaders are still practicing a lot of the technician or technical aspects that made them successful. And then there's a threshold and it gets to a point where the business is outgrowing uh, the need for them to be doing those things. And that's where, that's where the, the rubber starts hitting the road. Do you think it's an identity thing too? Absolutely. So I am that guy. That's right. Now um, I was, uh, I was privileged to, to meet Jeff Hoffman, the founder of Priceline.com yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he shared, uh, as when he got up on stage, he was a keynote speaker at this conference I was at. Um, and he shared that one day he comes in and there's nothing for him to do. And so he's like... Sounds good. <laughs> he's like, well, you know, and so he, he walks into a meeting and the people are like, hey, Jeff, how's it going? He's like, oh, I was just seeing if, you know, if I could be of help. And they're like, no, we got it. Have a good day. He's like, well, I, I, really, I've got some time. And they're like, oh, go play golf or something. And uh, and so he walks into the next meeting, you know, wandering around the building, finds another meeting, walks in. They're like, hey, Jeff, how's it going? He's like, good. They're like, did you need something? And he's like, oh, I just thought maybe I could, you know, contribute or, you know, see if I could help out with anything. And and they're like, uh, we got no, this. we got we got this. <laughs> and he's like, well, uh, I was just, you know, kind of kind of had some free time. They're like, well, go play golf or something, you know. Right. Happens like three times. <laughs> and he's like, I don't even play golf, you know. But, what do I do? Yeah. And he w- he really struggled with that, you know. Like, And f- so he meets with his VPs or executives, whoever. They're like, dude, take it as a compliment. You've built a team that can run mm-hmm. without you. That's like what you're supposed to do as a great leader. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We can see the, the other side of the coin of what we're talking about here when people retire and now they're no longer needed or wanted. Like he is experiencing unretired. Um, am I wanted? Am I needed? A- am I of value? Am I worthy? Right? So we hold on to those things. So we want to hold on to the very thing that made us successful. And so we will do that for agnosium. Um, versus maybe how do I get what's in me out of me into others? How do I duplicate myself? Um, How do I uh, pivot and transition my role? Um, I'm no longer the technician. I am now the wherever that goes. Um, 
in his case, what does a founder look like? What role do I play? And how do I hone that skill? I don't think that's easy. You know, going from, let's say, technician to CEO to founder to chairman of the board, those are all different skill sets. And we don't know what it's like until we get in, into it because it's not really taught. Mm -hmm. You don't go to school to figure out how to be a chairman of the board. Um, and so we have to figure it out. And each one of those times is a risk to our identity, mm. our ego, as to what that looks like. I think as a person of faith, if we're discerning what God is doing in our life, right? Mm -hmm. Just as, as I can imagine what Joshua must have felt like when all of a sudden Moses is done, Joshua is like, you got the two million people that don't know God, but the whole generation's wiped out and I'd like you to go into the promised land and you're going to lead these folks and you're the old man, but you really haven't aged. So you're just as strong as you were, but everyone's going to see you as, as the old guy. Mm -hmm. And if we think about it, it was 40 years. So the oldest person was 40 years old, mm -hmm. right? If the whole generation was wiped out and it except was 40 for those years, two. except for those two, yeah. right? So these are, this is an 80 year old more, mm -hmm. right? Leading, yeah, yeah, Caleb says I'm 80 years old today. Yeah, you know, or this year or whatever. Leading a, a group of 40, 30, 20 teens, right? That age group, zero to to 40, and um, they're it. They're the answer. They're the end deal. How how do you how do you transition that? Um, how do you let go of that? Mm. And in their case, how do they move two million people? You better bring up some leaders quick or you're going to have a problem. And they do, right? They have a couple of battles and there's some issues. In fact, uh, one of the very first things that um, God calls them to do is, is make sure that all the men are circumcised. That mass circumcision. <laughs> I don't, sorry, I don't know what that would look like or mm. don't want to know um, because they hadn't been practicing the very thing that it, it took to be able to, to live out their way of life. Mm. Um, and so a leader's got to, they've got to lead that and they got to be able to move that. Um, but that's scary. Let's say a leader's listening to this, uh, podcast or watching this podcast and they go, you know, I really need to learn to delegate better. You've coached a lot of CEOs. What are some practical places they could start? Is it a reading? Is it an action? Like what, what are some places they could go? I think it's experience. Again, we have a lot of knowledge. You can look up stuff on, on the internet. You could ask a young person, what does delegation mean? And they'll probably come back with a, a, a great answer. The question is, can they do it? Mm -hmm. They got to live it out. Um, so I have found projects, project management, right? If you've got a goal for the year, these are all the things that must happen in order to achieve that goal, which is going to hit probably most likely most of the departments in the company. Everybody's got to tow their part. Mm -hmm. And inside of each of those departments are small little projects, things that need to be done. There's big projects, but there's little projects inside of the big projects. And you give them the ability to be the point person on that small project. Mm -hmm. And then watch them. How did they do it? How did they get there? How did they build their team in and around them? How did they m move the task that might be a 40-hour task into 10 people to do four hours apiece versus two people doing 20 hours a piece, right? How, how did they achieve that? And what's, what's so great is that let's say the project is, you know, it's a one year goal and this project is two months and I meet with them for 30 minutes once a week. How'd it go? What did you achieve? What, what do you need? Um, what's your next task? What worked well? What didn't go, go well? And I, I have just that moment to be able to say, well, why don't you try this and try this? Tell me how it works next week. And it's so not only am I getting the job done, right, but I'm also bringing somebody up along the way mm -hmm. and I'm mentoring them um, and they're getting real life experience and I'm able to speak into that. Mm -hmm. And if they don't make it, they don't need to know that I was trying to see if they in a talent review, whether they were the next rung or two rungs above, they just didn't make it. And that's OK. They don't. They had an opportunity, mm -hmm. and I'll give them another opportunity if I see something later on. But if I do see it, then I know who to invest in mm -hmm. at the next rung and the next rung. I think that that is the easiest way. It's a long-term play, 
right? You, you don't create succession in leaders in a, in a quarter. Yeah. Well, it feels like that's where the biggest vacuum is. Uh, when the economy gets bad, we tend to pull training as one mm -hmm. of our first budget cuts, right? Um, R and D training marketing. Yeah, and so you're not you're not <laughs> suggesting this be a training program, but in some ways it kind of is, right? You've got to have that mindset of I've got to stop doing things the way I'm doing it, and I love the idea of projects. That, that's a lot of Fortune 500 companies do that, oh, right? It's the easiest way to be able to get the job done and give somebody an opportunity, mm -hmm. and and I think that the discernment in the leader is matching up the right project with the right person, mm -hmm. the, the scope, the size of it is, uh, has a chance for the greatest amount of success, right? Maybe on the edge of challenging them a bit, but they can be successful in it because really I want the project to be successful anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, how do I stack the deck of getting the right project in front of the right person for the right reason? Um, so I was in a, a hundred year old company fresh out of college. You were in a now well over 100-year-old company um, in, in part of your career, both of them large organizations, uh, years now, one, the largest private employer in Texas, you know, tens of thousands of people. Um, there's got to be a secret sauce to how a company gets to be 100 years old, and it's like those are multiple CEOs. Those are multiple chairmen of the board. But my experience was they were really good at this, identifying leaders, Mm -hmm. giving them a task or project or whatever and seeing how far they could go with it. And the ones that kept, you know, progressing, kept moving up through the ranks and the ones that after two or three, you know, rungs up the ladder, they kind of just stayed there and had a great life and loyal employee because you'd given them an opportunity to grow. Yeah. Was that your experience or have you seen that elsewhere? Or? Yeah. I would say that most of, um, it, there was, Yes. In, in the organization that I came from, I would say in that middle to lower ranks, a lot of people were promoted from within, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And in the upper ranks from, let's say, senior VP and above. Um, so that would be a, a senior VP, executive senior VP, chief officer. Those were all internal movements mm. of people. So those individuals had been with the company for a long period of time, had been given multiple roles. It's like you're in charge of this for these five years, but then all of a sudden you're going 180 degrees out and you're over here. Mm -hmm. And all people being exposed to different parts of the business holistically. And then those that survived it or did it well um, were able to put their their you know hat in the ring to say, hey, I would like to be considered for the next whatever it was. But here was the beauty is that I also saw a lot of leaders, um, they would come to a place and go, I think I'm at my end mm -hmm. and it's okay. Mm -hmm. They weren't blackballed for it. They weren't kicked out for it. It was, hey, I think I found my end. Here's my sweet spot. I want to stay here. And the company's like, you rock it there. Mm -hmm. So stay there, do that. We want to be able to milk that for all that it's worth. So there wasn't that weird feeling of if I don't succeed, I'm going to be fired. Um, and uh, so it was, and I would say that that was the case. There was a day where that switched, mm. where lots of people were coming from the outside. And in experiencing that, I can see where the failures were with that versus the other. And it took about 20 years for them to turn that back around and start doing more internal um, grading and raising up. And raising up mm -hmm. and promoting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that overall, we used to say that that company is the greatest exporter of um, entrepreneurs because those that did leave usually started their own business. Mm. So that means they were well equipped, mm -hmm. you know, very well equipped to be able to do what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I just, it feels, it's felt for a long time if the small and medium sized businesses could catch this vision for delegation. Mm -hmm. they could really make a positive impact whether they ever grow the top line or not. Right. I mean, fine. If you want to stay a $5 million business, have a great lifestyle and raise up a few people in, in your ranks to become solid leaders, eternal maybe, treasure, right? Maybe they launch off and do their own thing. Yeah. You know, um, but you got a culture that rocks because everybody feels empowered and involved mm -hmm. and, and, you know, or maybe that $5 million company accidentally becomes a $10 million company because 
You're creating right. a culture that most people don't have. And to do that without abdicating, mm-hmm. right? Because we can take that too far mm. where, let's say, who you were talking about earlier, um, hey, I'm not needed, so I'm going to go play golf five days a week, take my eye off the ball entirely, mm-hmm. right? When I still have the responsibility, I'm still drawing a salary, I'm still drawing the dividends, I'm still taking from the company, but I'm not contributing in any way. So what does contribution look like at that moment in time? Because there is a role and responsibility that that we've got to play. Mm-hmm. There's a value proposition, a contribution um, to be able to give to the company, but it can change. Mm-hmm. And when you're the leader and you get to make the rules, then make the rules that are going to enhance everybody. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I think it's hard. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, we know it's hard. Because we talked to a lot of leaders that wrestle with it, <laughs> just just don't do it. It's really hard to get out of the out of the way. Um, I think we have that in our parenting, uh-huh. right? I was talking to a parent. It's it's all in the same subject. Um, uh, the other day about how to uh, maybe address their kiddo, and their kiddo was fifteen, and um, the idea was to handle kiddo as if they were seven or eight, mm-hmm. right? It's like wow, well, well, it's not going to work anymore. Um, kiddos a little older, um, putting those tight guardrails and that, you know, definition of what the do's and the don'ts, Mm -hmm. um, those days are gone. Now we're working in the gray and how do you help them, teach them to make great decisions on their own? We have to, we have to let go a little bit. Yeah. Dr. Henry Cloud, if that, if that touches anybody's heart, when you said that, um, has a couple of great chapters on that. Mm Mm-hmm. Parenting in different seasons. He's got a lot of books that talk about that, Mm -hmm. right? But yet at the same time, again, not stepping away where you're abdicating. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're old enough, go figure it out. Mm -hmm. No, because a 15-year-old is going to get themselves into trouble, and you don't want that either. So how do we walk that the right pace, the right amount at the right time? I think in leadership, we have to do the same. But I, I back to what started our conversation, I think it's becoming vital that we do. Um, I think our nation needs it more than ever. Um, there's there's more fear of of leadership in the younger generations, and we need them to be strong. Mm, yeah, that's good. Robert, thanks so much for your time and your thoughts. Joel, this is a joy. Thank it's you. Always a pleasure to have you here. So likewise. We'll chat soon. Love you, brother. Love you too. Thanks for joining us for this episode of A Leader's Journey podcast. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to our channel.